truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? Do you want biblical answers to today's issues? Issues and Answers for Today will provide answers from God's Word. Join our host, Doug Stroop, for this episode of Issues and Answers for Today. Welcome to another edition of Issues and Answers for Today. I'm your host, Doug Stroop, here today with, once again, our guest, Dr. Stan Pond. Stan, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited about being here, and thank you for selecting our topic for today. Right. It's going to be a good one. Yes, it is. I'm excited about it as well. And the reason we are is because today's program is going to be a little bit different. Normally, we ask some really tough questions. We talk about very tough issues, and we're still going to do that. But something that we've done to, for you today, uh, the viewer, the listener, is you may have noticed throughout our previous programs, we have asked you, if you have questions, if anything we've talked about has brought up questions in your mind that you would like to get answers to, we've been asking you to simply send us those through email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. So for today's program, we've gone into those emails and we've chosen two of those questions that we want to address those issues, right, on today's program directly from you, our listening audience, our, our viewer out there. And so today, Let's jump right into that. Let's right? do it. Here's the first question. All right. Um, it seems in today's world that there is a confusion mm -hmm. about these two terms, mm -hmm. discipleship and evangelism. Mm -hmm. So here's the question. Are they the same or is there a distinction between the two? There is a distinction between the two. And what we teach at our college, we cover the what we call a total evangelistic program. Mm -hmm. And it really boils down to four parts, but they're also in order. The first part, when we're engaging someone, we call that simply contact. Our idea is to help them come to faith alone in Christ and then to go on to become a fully obedient worshiper of Christ. But to do that, we have to engage them. So that contact is to get to know them, find out where they are in their faith journey, and in some measure, determine if they've trusted Christ as Savior or not, mm -hmm. and if not, stay in stage one and lead in the, them to Christ. Stage two is, after they've trusted Christ, we call that the follow-up stage. Contact stage, now follow-up. Follow-up is making sure they have a Bible, making sure that they understand a little bit that there's more beyond just being saved. You get saved by faith alone, but you grow by obedience. And so we begin to talk to them about what it means to follow up and know a little bit about prayer. The third stage is really the discipleship stage. Sure. This is where we bring the person to the point after he's trusted Christ, where there's a surrender to his lordship to say, all right, Lord, I want to learn about you. I want to be your student. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So discipleship is we're now with a person. He's beyond being saved. He knows a little bit about what he's got to start doing, but this is the stage where he gives it up for the Lord as discipleship. But even then, the fourth stage is what I call the multiplication stage. That's where we repeat the process with another person. So we teach them how they can now contact someone, follow them up, disciple them, and helping that person now to repeat the process with someone else. So that's the total program. Hmm. So I really hope that the person that submitted this question to us is watching the program today to get this understanding. So. You just gave us a foundation of that, right, and how the process of that. So there is definitely a difference between evangelism and discipleship. Absolutely. So then tell us, then, what is the definition, first, of evangelism? Okay. If you take it back to the original word, is euangelion, and that's like ting-tang, walla, walla, bing-bang to some people, <laughs> but in essence, it really is, it simply means good, you, in angelion, we get a word angel, and we know that means messenger, so it's like the good angel. And so we don't look at Jesus as being the angel, but we certainly look at him as being the messenger. So he would be referred to as the evangel. He's the one who is now giving the good news. So when you talk about evangelism or evangelist, you have the messenger and you have the message, but it's all wrapped up around the term good. So now we have to ask ourselves, what is good? The gospel, good news, euangelion. Well, what is it? The death and resurrection of Christ. Well, what's so good about that? It's when he did that, he paid for the sins of the world. And by faith alone in Christ who did that, we receive the free gift of eternal life. So that's evangelism, salvation. And we make sure that the person knows it's not by works. Sure. It's simply by trusting Christ. That's the term for evangelism. Okay, so then what about discipleship? What does that mean? Another good term. 
in the Greek, it's methateo or methates. There's different variations of it, but basically it means a learner, student, or pupil. This is one, someone who says, I want to know, I want to learn, I want to know more. And generally in the context of Scripture, systematic theology, I want to know more about the Lord. And to know more about the Lord, the more of the Word you know, the more of the Lord you know. So therefore you want to learn the Word, so you become a student. Jesus also said that in discipleship, he gives a lot of different qualifications. For salvation, he simply says, trust in Christ and Christ alone. But in discipleship, he says, if you do this, you will be my disciple. If you don't do this, you won't be my disciple. Mm -hmm. So you're in or out with discipleship. It's like a full consecration. And that's kind of important for us to know that that's what those terms mean. So there's definitely a difference. We've determined that. Uh, the definitions now of evangelism and discipleship. So Stan, why don't you give us like a, a biblical explanation of what is discipleship. Good. I'd like to explain it to you this way, and there's two, in my opinion, my favorite passages of scriptures. One is called the Great Commission, and of course we know that's about sharing the gospel. Sometimes I like to call it the Great Omission, because Christians today aren't really adamantly <clears throat> sharing their faith like they should. I could also call it the Great Commission. Because sure. it says that he will be with us to the end of the age, and so that means we do it with the Lord. So that's a co-mission. I like to say it this way. It's the great go mission, because yeah. it's a mission that we need to go. Now, like the command that. in that verse is not to go. They're already assuming that you're going. So he says, as you go about your life, yes. then you make disciples, and then it tells you how to do that. And I like that because it talks about make them a disciple and then mark them through baptism and mature them through growth and then multiply them to do all the things the Lord said to do. The other favorite passage I have is found in Colossians, and it's almost my life passage. It talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27, then 28 and 29 says, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man that we may present every man perfect in Christ. So we preach to everybody, that's evangelism. We teach every man, those that are believers. Why? To mature them in Christ. And the cool part is the next verse where Paul says, and I will labor doing this in the Greek now, to the point of weariness, not according to my power, but according to his power. So mm -hmm. that's really kind of evangelism and then discipleship. Probably my, my favorite quote comes from the founder of Radio Bible Class. Those of you that have been around a long time, you remember M.R. DeHaan, and then you have Richard DeHaan, sure. and they have the Daily yeah. Bread and all of that. He said it, in my opinion, the very best. So I'm going to quote M.R. DeHaan as he makes the distinction between salvation and discipleship. And here's how the quote goes. It goes like this. There is a vast difference between coming to Jesus for salvation and coming after Jesus for service. Coming to Christ makes one a believer. Coming after Christ makes one a disciple. I love that when he says that. All believers are not disciples. To become a believer, one accepts the invitation of the gospel. But to be a disciple, one obeys the challenge of a life that is fully dedicated in service and separation. Salvation comes through the sacrifice of Christ, but discipleship comes only by the sacrifice of ourself and surrender to his call for devoted service. Salvation is free. Salvation cannot be lost because it depends upon God's faithfulness. But discipleship can be lost because it depends upon our faithfulness. So there is a distinction. Now, I want to make this clear, though. I'd like a person to trust Christ as Savior, but I don't want them to wait years before they surrender. I would like to have that at the same time, as long as they know that they're not surrendering to living a brand new life in the acts of getting saved, that they understand it's by grace through faith, yes. not by works. But soon afterwards, they would then fully surrender to his lordship as a way to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. I'm going to live a thank you life mm. of full surrender and discipleship. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for laying down that foundation and, the, and distinguishing, distinguishing between the two mm -hmm. of salvation and discipleship. Right. Right? Salvation, mm -hmm. one-time act, trust in Christ, in Christ as Savior. Discipleship, ongoing, right? Mm -hmm. Become mm -hmm. a disciple, a follower. Truly. Renewing your mind every day. Is right, it? renewing mm -hmm. our minds every day. So mm -hmm. thank you. Hopefully... That has been a good understanding biblical truth and education to answer the question between the difference of evangelism and discipleship. You know, there's so much information there, we should probably do a whole program just on those two, right? Evangelism and discipleship. But for right now, we're going to go take a break. 
And we have two questions, right, that we're going to cover. So we're going to get to the second one here right after we come back from the break. We've got a special message for you right now. So take a listen to this and uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Issues and answers for today will be right back. Here at Make It Clear Studio, we are a multifaceted film production company. What do I mean by that? We're currently operating as a threefold film production company. We are producing a film series of, of short films, if you will, called The Bible Says. In this series, we are targeting our middle and high school students with the issues that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether in school or out there in life, wherever it may be, and we're giving them biblical truths. What does the Bible say about the issues that they're dealing with in a day-to-day -day basis? We're also working on a TV show, a series, another series, called Issues and Answers for Today. Now, this one is targeted more at the young adult and on with, again, issues that they're, they're dealing with on a daily basis or maybe questions that they have, and we're able to give them Bible truth to help them in their lives be able to deal with those issues or those questions that they have in life. We're also entered into the feature film world. Uh, our first one is called My Name is Melissa. It is a brilliant look. The script is already ready to go. It's a brilliant look at abortion, which is a big issue, from a pro-life perspective. You're going to want to watch that film. You're going to want to see issues and answers for today. You're going to want to see The Bible Says. But in all of these, we need your help. We would love to partner with you. We would love to have you partner with us in simply going to Make It Clear. Dot org, make it clear dot org. You can click on donate if you choose to do that, and you can there from a list choose to donate to the studio to help us in continuing getting the message of God's Word that is desperately needed out there today to our middle and high school students, to our young adults and beyond, and to be able to present them the biblical truths. What does God's Word have to say? Life-changing information. We thank you for prayerfully considering helping us here at Make It Clear Studio. Welcome back to Issues and Answers for Today. In the first half of this program, we talked about the difference between evangelism and discipleship. Well, we're going to change gears here in just a moment, but I wanted you to know that you can go to makeitclear.org and you can click on the marketplace there. And there's a lot of information on evangelism. There's tracks there. There's, there's helps, right, that you can Absolutely. to help you to share the gospel with other people, to then uh, give, have the Bible answers and the Bible truth, really to equip you, right, in becoming uh, a better Christian, if I can say it yeah. that way, being more equipped to share your faith and to answer the questions that other people in your world may have. Right now, we're going to actually jump over to something that's totally, totally different. Another question that we pulled out from our emails that came from one of our viewers. This is a very hot topic today. And here's, this, here's the question. Um, how should I respond when my child has seen pornography? Well, I have to tell you, that is a hot topic. It is. I mean, it is something that one of our, our listeners really wanted to hear. It's so interesting because I knew that was coming up, and I started sharing that with others. Mm -hmm. And every one of them said, I want to know the answer to that question. Sure. And it's really important. It's not if my child sees pornography. The operative word is when he will, because yeah. we live in a day-to-day -day that we can almost guarantee every child in the world, or at least America, will certainly be able to view pornography. Sometimes it's by accident as they're just on their phone. Others it's by curiosity. A lot of times it could even be with their friends. And then it's around the house. They yeah. can stumble upon their dad's pornography as wrong as that is. So it's absolutely everywhere. So we need to know that. I read some statistics recently that said that the average child today will see pornography by the time he is 11 years old. Now, wow. again, that's the average. That means some see it much yes, younger. Yes. Now, we can try to play games with all the different ways we want to say that's pornography, that's not, that is. All we know is that which we set before our eyes that is not honoring and glorifying to the Lord, especially about the person that we're looking at, male or female, in whatever act that might be in any way that's not honoring to the Lord, that very well could be a form of pornography 
although it generally revolves around sexual issues. We understand that. The other statistics that might really surprise you is that the children, all the way up to the age of about 24, they said that two-thirds of the boys have seen pornography, and they look at it at least once a month. And the shocking one is one-third of the girls in that age bracket, they have seen pornography, and they look at it at least once a month. Mm. Now, in my opinion, those are statistics. I don't know how they can actually prove it. I'm actually believing that no matter what survey they might take, that it's probably a lot more than what those statistics really say. So it's not if your child sees pornography, it is when they see pornography. And your question is, what do you do? Well, we'll go through a couple of those answers, but the first thing I would like to encourage them to do if a parent sees that their child is is viewing this is to immediately, when that happens, calm down. Sure. All right? Don't, don't, I know your juices are flowing. You want to really, really respond. I mean, you're shocked, you're hurt, you're angry, you're embarrassed, and and those kind of emotions are pretty normal. But if they're not kept in check, it'll actually cut you off at the pass, so to speak, and you won't be as effective working with them. So slow down a little bit so that you'll be able to properly put this in the right context. Next, when you now begin to unload on the child to be able to do this, do it in a more question and answer fashion. Yes, a little bit a matter of fact, but at the same time, it's a serious conversation. Don't sure. shy away from it. In fact, I would look at it as a God opportunity that God has given to you to be able to help them. So look at it as a teaching opportunity. Absolutely. If possible, when you find out about it, do it as much alone as you can. One, that way you won't be distracted during the conversation. That way you can speak freely create an environment that is safe and secure for that child to speak. Now, we will be speaking on some sin and that type of thing, but at the same time, so that the child will open up and give you some of those true feelings and you can dig a little bit deeper. So that's the beginning of some of the solutions. Right. You know, Stan, I'm so thankful that you mentioned those words, a teaching opportunity. As a parent, right, you know, I have Mm -hmm. seven children. My wife and I have been blessed with seven children, two boys, five girls, and Obviously, throughout their time, you know, raising children, any of us as parents raising children, um, our children are going to make some choices that are not the right choice to make, Mm -hmm. right? And many, many times that leads to sin. So how do we respond to that in the life of our children when we find that they have looked at pornography, when when we find that they have done any type of sin? I totally agree that rather than condemning you know, let's respond to them, obviously letting them know the seriousness of the sin and that there is discipline, there is correction that needs to take place in their Mm -hmm. lives. But use that as a teaching opportunity rather than a condemning. And so many just start yelling and, you know, why did you do this? And Mm -hmm. why can't you do what's right? Why can't you just Mm -hmm. be good? Mm -hmm. Mm. Let's talk more about that as a teaching opportunity for, for the parent. Yes, and there's two ways to teach it. One, when it immediately comes up in front of you, which to me is a little bit late. Mm -hmm. I think the whole aspect of giving them good, we'll call it sex education, starts from the youngest years. Sooner the better, That doesn't mean you're talking all about it, but you're modeling it in front of your kids, you know, Mm -hmm. how you dress or undress or what they see, what they don't see, what you watch on TV, what you see in movies. It starts by the modeling of what proper sexuality is all about. So I think it depends on that. But should it come up, even that when I see my child looking at pornography, I have to ask the question, child, how old is he? Right. You know, how did this come about? So I don't jump on him. Oh, that's sin, because that all of a sudden makes sex sin, and sex isn't sinful, all right? right. There are certain aspects about it that can be, sure. but not all of it is. It's like the little boy that said, Dad, where'd they come from? And so Dad sat him down for an hour, went through all the birds and the bees, and he said, oh, okay, Oh, Bobby came from Boston. I just want to know where I came from, you know? So you got to figure out the yes. question and where they are at. Yet all the time, I think we need to be a part of it. So I made a list of some areas in case our viewers wanted to be able to embrace some direction in what they might be able to do. And again, it is age sensitive. It's also what I'll call mature sensitive based on your child. Some kids are seven going on 17. Some sure. are seven going on, you know, three, you know? So you have to know your own child. And it, it is always better if guys speak to guys, you know, dads yes. with sons and mothers with daughters, et cetera, and um, have those kind of healthy private conversations. So first of all, I would encourage them to begin talking about it at an early age, a little bit at a time, appropriate setting, 
so that they're already set. Now, again, this is more on sex education than it is just on the pornography issue, and our main topic is pornography, but that still is important. The other is, is to discern, was this a curiosity thing? Is it, and of course, curiosity can lead into lust and further on, but have to decide, is this a curiosity thing? And then begin to deal with the right and the wrong of the pornography part of it, because God made every person in the image of God for a particular purpose to bring glory to him and is what or are what's happening is that sinful or not and so we really have to be able to see our our bodies as the temple of the holy spirit and are we using it for a godly way so again those are deep truths but they have to be explained in a simple way in a few minutes should we have a few more minutes i will give our viewers a couple of um, resources they can go to to give them a lot more information than what I'm giving on the, today's program. Right, and obviously you mentioned, and I totally agree, that it's always best to start discussing these types of things with our children sooner rather than later. Than later. They're going to go out, they're going to be curious, and they're going to find out from little Johnny at the ballpark or somewhere mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. all of this stuff, and they're going to have a wrong view. They need mm-hmm. to know what God's view is. So You know, that really brings us down to this foundation of what a great opportunity it is to present the gospel, right, to Mm -hmm. our children. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want them to understand that they're sinners, and that's why Jesus died to pay for their sin. They can have everlasting life. So it's also just a teaching opportunity in that Mm -hmm. area, right, of, Mm -hmm. of sex education and pornography. But it's also a wonderful opportunity to present the gospel to our children. We could talk about what is pornography versus just true sexuality. So sure. let's just talk about pornography right now. Okay. When we do that, when we explain it to our, our children, our young people, teenagers, maybe uh, junior high age, whatever, we have to let them know that in the context of that, that it's not an unforgivable sin that they looked at pornography. Mm-hmm. Okay. But what it is is an opportunity to let them know that this is not pleasing to the Lord. Sure. We need to make sure that our eyes are looking on that which is holy and yes. right making sure we're thinking about what is right and what goes through our eye gate, goes in our mind, then we can think about it at night and the much we see on, you know, screens or magazines, whatever. So it's an opportunity to let them know that the Lord still forgives us and we still need a Savior when we go through that. So help them understand that. Now, if they are a Christian, then let them know that this is a time for them that it is wrong, it's not healthy, it's not biblical. What should they do about it? Confess it. What's right. the next thing they should do about it? Hmm. Forsake it. Hmm. What's the next thing you should do? Avoid it, you know, and teach them those things. And while at the same time, letting them know that the proper intimacy within marriage, where both people are pleasured properly, then there's great joy and fulfillment that that is the sure. ultimate yeah. for God. And that's God's design, mm-hmm. right? And so I have to go back to this. That I believe that if we do lead our children to Christ early mm-hmm. in life, I mean, that's mm-hmm. obviously the ultimate goal as we raise our children. We want them to come to know Christ as their personal Savior early in life. And so I would have to say that the sooner that that takes place in the life of a child, mm-hmm. then it may very well keep them from these types of things, sure. right, uh, ever uh, occurring in their lives. I think so. I think we talked about, you know, you take care of yourself, the parent, so you don't overreact. But at the same time, you still need to act. Yes. So I call it proactive. And proactive would be, are, do you need as a parent to set up more parameters around your own Internet experience around the house? Secondly, do you need to maybe uh, reduce the amount of screen time for the kids or the freedom that the kids have? at least around your own home, you know, those types of things. So it begins to put a governor on them. I'd like to suggest a particular book or two that the parents might want to read carefully. They may not agree with everything in the book, but there's so much in there that'll help them. It's a really great tool for them. The first book is titled Raising Teens in a Mm Hypersexualized World. Raising Teens in a Hypersexualized World. The second book is called Raising Kids in a Screen-Saturated World. It's written by the same author. I like what she has to say. It's Eliza Huey. That's H-U-I-E if you want to look up the author. That way they'll have a little bit more to work with than just this little vignette that we have on today's program. Mm. Well, as we wrap up, you know, it always goes by so quickly, but I do want to say there's so much information here. Stan, I believe that you and I need to devote an entire other program 
to this issue of pornography. Yes. Because it really is something that is plaguing, right? Not just our country, but around the world. And so many, there's high percentages, right? Even of those that are actively involved in church, those that are professing Christians that have become addicted to pornography. It's not just what I do when I, when my child sees pornography. It's as adults, how can we just escape and get away from the addiction that that causes in the adult's life? So we'll do that. Let's yes. come back on another program yes. and just, you know, um, do an entire program just on this plague. It's devastating. Of pornography. Devastating. Yeah. As we close today, I do want to say thank you for the first question, right, mm-hmm. of, of giving us some clarity on the distinction between evangelism and discipleship. And then on the second question of today's program on how to respond as a parent when our child uh, sees pornography. I want to thank you for that. Do you have any closing comments before we close down the program? I would. And that is not to ignore the issue when the child is looking at pornography. Handle it biblically, graciously. Handle it often. Work with it. And then on the issue of salvation, you know, we may know the distinction between salvation and discipleship, but the real question now is what are we going to do with it? Sure. We have the truth. Now we need to share that by coming alongside people who don't know Christ as Savior and begin to engage them on a healthy conversation about the simple person of Jesus Christ who died and rose again, and by faith alone in Christ, they can have everlasting life. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining me for today's program, Dr. Pond. My pleasure. It's just been Wonderful. Great to give our viewers the Bible truth, the answers that you need so that you can be fully equipped in reaching to our children, right? In raising our children in a godly home and in answering these questions that come up from your world of influence. If you have other questions, you can simply contact us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. You can also go to makeitclear.org and click on our marketplace, and there you'll find a lot of information that will really equip you in your Christian life. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next time for more issues and answers for today.